take it. Great. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here and for having me as your interpreter today. I'm going to go ahead and provide these instructions in Spanish to make sure we can all participate in the language of our heart or in the language of our preference. Thank you for your patience. Hola a todos. Mi nombre es Alejandro Arrieta. Seré su intérprete el día de hoy. Eh, en este espacio queremos trabajar hacia la justicia del lenguaje que indica que cada persona debe de poder participar en el idioma de su preferencia. Por lo tanto, si usted prefiere el español, después de estas instrucciones va a haber un icono, icono terráqueo en la parte inferior a mano derecha en su pantalla, al menos que haya ingresado a la junta usando un dispositivo móvil, tal como celular o tableta. En ese caso va a haber el menú con los tres puntitos que dice más. Ahí, ahí también puede ver la opción de la interpretación. Como sea que aparezca en su pantalla, asegúrese de eh, escoger y avisarnos en los mensajes de chat si tiene algún problema. All right, y con eso ya vamos a aprender la interpretación. We can now turn on the interpretation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Alejandro. Awesome. All right, so good morning, everyone. Thank you all so very much for being with us this morning. Um, it is August 10th. This is the 8.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. session for our health and safety uh, training related to our quality improvement plan for early learning ventures, child care partnerships. And this morning, we're going to do a few housekeeping items. And uh, before we get officially started, we will introduce ourselves, Briley and I, and uh, then we will jump in and explain to you uh, as our audience in regards to the type of webinar that we are presenting. So my name is Ty Johnson. My pronouns are she, her and hers, and I am the recently um, promoted Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships Director for Early Learning Ventures. And we are delivering this training today um, as an opportunity to increase the health and safety uh, and wellness of both children and the staff and all those who come in contact with children in your program. Awesome. My name is Briley Landers. I'm a child care partnership specialist in Morgan County, and I'm going to be helping out with the chat and also the Q&A. Um, so uh, like Ty said earlier, the chat is just kind of for a little, you know, maybe comments or encouragements or things like that. And then the Q&A is for the questions that you want us to have answered. Um, and then that will just make sure that they're documented and that we see them um, and so that you get those answered. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate you. And so as we get started this morning, I am going to truly share my screen. And one second. And just in this moment, if you haven't filled out the Google Doc that I've sent in the chat, um, please do that. And I'll send it again. And you can see my screen, Brian? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's so interesting because when you turn on the screen, everything shrinks. So it looks so funny to me. Um, so I um, hope that everyone is comfortable with this uh, dissemination of information being recorded. Um, that's another reason why we also have it one way. So then that way your audio nor your video is actually being captured. The use of the chat feature and the Q&A, as Briley shared, is imperative to your participation. Uh, throughout this presentation, you will see a Google Doc pop up. That Google Doc needs to be signed, and there's three areas that need to be signed in that Google Doc. Riley, what were those three areas, please? Yep, so it is the site um, or the title of the place that you work at and then your name and then your email address. Awesome. And so thank you for that. I appreciate it. We are going to do these housekeeping items just to make sure we're all on the same page as well as to just give a visual to where things could be found. Now, keep in mind, please, that this uh, visual is on a laptop or tablet um, or desktop. So if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see some thought bubbles and um, that is to symbolize chat. That is your opportunity to, to send messages 
in chat to everyone, actually, not just the hosts and panelists, but to everyone, so everyone can see your chat. Um, that is general. Then you're going to see Q&A. This is to ask specific questions, okay? Please, please, please utilize that Q&A, as Briley shared earlier, in regards to any specific questions you want to have answered related to health and safety, positive behavioral guidance, and child incident reporting. Um, as Alejandro shared with us earlier, if you are in need of interpretation, please do press the interpretation um, image on the bottom of your screen. So then that way you can listen in your heart language. We're all here today to review the information related to health and safety. This is a training that will focus on incident reporting child health and safety, as well as promoting positive behavioral guidance. We are, our intentions, at least for this particular training and discussing these particular areas are on the screen here. Take a moment and please review and read those intentions. And then we will discuss our learning objectives. Fantastic. Here are our learning objectives this morning. We want to understand the child safety incident and reporting process. We want to identify opportunities and strategies for keeping children safe. And lastly, we want to increase the knowledge on positive behavioral guidance and practices. Please, 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 by all means, if you have a thought or an idea or something that's working very well for your program and your practice that has been proven to keep children safe, please put it in chat because what you're doing could then help someone else to improve their practices as well as improve our delivery of this message, tried and true. So get your water, get your coffee, get your tea, get your juice, and let's jump on in. As questions arise, you can again use the Q&A feature, um, as well as if there's a statement or comment, please feel free to put it in chat. As we shared, we're here for um, health and safety of children. So first we're going to cover child safety incident reporting. We're gonna talk about the what, when, and who related to reporting. What incidents must be reported? This is an opportunity for you to type into chat so you can just give some general responses um, as it applies to your, your program and the things that you are familiar with reporting to child care licensing um, as well as CPS. So in your experience, you can chat about the things that you have reported. So in regards to our information delivery, child injuries that require medical treatment, they could be things like uh, a severe sprain, a uh, chipped or cracked tooth, closed head trauma, a deep cut or laceration, um, an animal bite even. So things like that. And in your experience, please do put into chat some of the things of which you may report on. Inappropriate discipline should always be reported. These are not limited to the kind of typical things that we see, the yanking and the pulling and things like that. This also includes humiliation of young children, uh, ridiculing, pinching children, poking at them. And also, this is important to make note, using punishment as a reward system, no bueno. <laughs> um, so we want to make sure that we are thinking about our behavior as educators in regards to how appropriate or inappropriate that is for young children. One of the things that I always like to give some highlight on in this particular area about inappropriate discipline is that isolating a child is actually inappropriate discipline. Um, in many years of practice, we have seen where folks... Uh, bring little Timmy and, and put little Timmy 
in his own place. Unless that's a place of purpose and of calm and really being intentional with positive guidance, that could also be deemed as isolation. So in your programs, if you utilize the phrase time out, please be conscientious and cautious of that phrase because it's, it's not necessarily a positive behavioral response to behavior of young children. It's definitely something that you want to speak about with your directors or owners, or if you're a family child care provider, something you may want to reconsider. Um, it's a different to have a calm down space that's then guided with some instruction. Take deep breaths, close your eyes if you feel safe, little Timmy. Just lean your head to the side and just take a moment. That's very different than go sit in the corner. And so we want to be very mindful of that. Potential and known child abuse and maltreatment. We really hope that that is something that happens on a small scale in our programs. This includes like grabbing young children, shaking them, swatting them, dragging them across the room, any type of spanking whatsoever. Uh, so any type of corporal punishment or physical punishment, um, specifically here, binding or trying to withhold or restrain or even tape a child down, those are all considered maltreatment. One of the things to remember about supervision is that supervision has to happen all the time. Any time where there is a child present, supervision needs to be active. This is indoors as well as outdoors. This is near buses. This is near your entrance, near your exits, inside your learning environments. Decrease those blind spots. Supervision must be active at all times. And lastly here, unauthorized release. For, to my knowledge, everyone does a really great job in regards to keeping their files up to date around authorized release. And so we just want to really give attention to the need to make sure that you are utilizing photos for identification and making sure that that release is to a legal guardian or someone who has been authorized by the parent and you have it in writing and you have documentation stating so. I'm gonna take a moment to pause. Briley, is there anything fantastic that you wanna share from the chat? Um, we just have some examples uh, that they said. Um, so Jessica said, biting, falls, scratches, bruises. Uh, Sarah said, broken bone, not meeting physical or nourishment needs, staff and parents. And Lori said, bug bites and allergic reactions. Those bug bites are serious. Ooh. I don't know if y'all saw that new picture of that new bug that just came out. It's uh, given some kind of fever, lemon fever or some kind of, mm -hmm. some kind of fever it's giving. It's this weird, odd looking bug. Um, there's been two cases so far uh, in the United States. So yeah, bites are, are important. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate you. All right. When must a program report an incident? Reports must be submitted to Early Learning Ventures within 24 hours of the incident occurring. Um, that's that's not, the incident happened two days ago. Oh, we forgot. Let's report it to ELB. Um, we really need to have those incidents reported to us within 24 hours. The main reason for that is because we then also need to report to the regional program specialists. Uh, we do have seven calendar days of the incident, and that can get a little confusing, which is why we really want to stress the importance of communicating with us within that first 24 hours, be, or within 24 hours of the incident, because if you do anything outside of that, and then we have this pattern of people taking time off, you know, that PTO stuff, uh, if they're taking time off and they haven't gotten to something you've communicated, we could potentially be outside of that seven day window, which could cause us a problem, of course. And so it's really, really super important that we are adhering to that 24 hours of reporting 
as soon as the incident occurs. So then that way we can report to our regional specialist. The who, who does a program report an incident to? Your program reports the incident to our child care partnerships at earlylearningventures.org email, and you can copy in your assigned specialist. This is super important because we have now have documentation of the report being made in a timely manner. So we really, really, really want to adhere to this and make sure that everyone is reporting to this particular website, Child Care Partnerships at earlylearningventures.org, and please do copy in your assigned specialist. This gives us a checks and balance in regards to uh, reporting and communication. So in the event we have someone out, the specialist is now activated to say, hmm, it's been 24 hours, no one's responded to this email that I'm copied in on. And they are alerted to then follow up and call somebody. Where can you find more information? If you have any guests at all, put them in chat. So as you all know, we are federally funded. The federal website is ECLKC. And on this particular website, you are able to get a plethora of information in regards to the Office of Head Start. Not that that's a giveaway, but it might be. You can always connect with us at earlylearningventures.org as well. And you can find a lot of information in this particular location. And so when you think about where you can find information, we want to make sure that you are familiar with the Office of Head Start's website, the Early Childhood Learning and Knowledge Center, ECLKC. And let me, uh, actually, Briley, could you go on line and just copy and paste ECLKC and chat? So at least that way we know everybody's had it once, right? Um, so this is a great, great, great website. This has the entire Head Start program performance standards on it. Um, and if you go on to our Early Learning Ventures website, you will see all of our service plans as well. Obviously, a lot of other information, but for your sake in particular, you will hit the Early Head Start uh, resources option, and it'll pull up everything related to Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships. And so it's really, really super important that you become familiar with those two resources because there's a plethora of information on there, as well as obviously you have your monthly um, health and safety reminder emails that come from our very own Kaylee Smith. Um, she's very consistent about those emails. And you also have your assigned child care partnership coach specialist. And so we just really want to uh, reiterate the importance of making sure that you have access to these locations. If there's any questions or anything before we move on to the next piece, please put those in Q&A. Or if you have any general comments, please feel free to put that in chat. Our goal here is to keep children safe. We want to do zero harm to young children who are in our care. Ultimately, we want to create a culture of safety. This engages every single individual that cares for young children. Within this culture of safety, there are 10 actions that we have identified that helps create this culture of safety. It is important that you are considering these particular actions and how they apply to your program. Sorry, I'm having a wonky moment with my computer. Decided to turn on a white screen or something. I probably have a timer on. <laughs> And so just take a look in regards to these ways of which you can create a culture of safety. One of the big ones on here, you'll notice, of course, we repeat over and over and over again, is that active supervision piece. Very, very, very important. This is a huge part of what we like to consider 
the Office of Head Start's focus for health and safety of young children. We are going to discuss that a little bit more deeply as we go on. But please take a moment to genuinely read over uh, the various components of creating a culture of safety. The other thing that we want to make sure that we uh, give some attention to is that even though ELV doesn't provide transportation, and we actually can't support that even in regards to the, the federal funding, uh, some sites do provide transportation. And so we do ask that you, of course, have uh, transportation safety policies and procedures that you uh, orchestrate in your programs. And so that's very, very important. Again, even though this is not included in our early Head Start services for ELV, it might be included in your program delivery. So being mindful of that is very important as well. Thinking about modeling safe behaviors, these could be things like making sure you are demonstrating to young children how to use materials and supplies, as well as furniture in your learning spaces. This becomes very important when you're thinking about, oh, I'm so tired, I'm just gonna take a second, and then you wanna sit on a table. You can't yell or, or vent or do anything to little Johnny. If little Johnny sees you sitting on the table, guess what little Johnny's gonna eventually do? He's gonna sit on the table. Uh, they're just little, little mirror spawns of us, and they're going to imitate and copy everything that we do. So being mindful of things like that, it's very beneficial when keeping children safe. All right. Give you one more second here. You can pick a gander at that. All right. We're gonna switch gears here a little bit and talk specifically about the standards of conduct. This is probably one of the most important pieces, all of it is important, but this is probably one of the most important pieces to give some attention to as it relates to our health and safety. This is where a lot of our feedback has come from in regards to making sure children are safe. One of the things that we wanna reiterate here is that this standard of conduct applies to all staff. This is whether they're Head Start or whether they're non-Head Start, um, it doesn't matter. It applies to all staff. It also applies to contractors and consultants. And if you have any volunteers come into your program as well. So you really wanna be mindful to make sure that you have a really good onboarding process and a good orientation to your program expectations as contractors, consultants, and volunteers and new staff members are hired in your program. Within these standards of conduct, as you can see here on the screen, implementation of positive strategies to support children's well being and prevent and address challenging behaviors are of key. Avoidance of any maltreatment respect and promote the unique identity of each child and family, as well as the avoidance of stereotyping on any bias, on any basis. Compliance with ELV's confidentiality policies concerning personally identifiable information and assurance that no child is left alone or unsupervised while under the program's care. Again, this relates to all staff, contractors, consultants, and volunteers. We want to really reiterate in this capture here that the use of corporal punishment, isolation, unnecessary restraints, any physical use of, of, of punishment or uh, using food as reward, using food as punishment, none of that is acceptable. We can't restrain children. We can't restrict their movements. Um, we really want to avoid humiliating and demoralizing young children. Uh, we might think fatty, fatty two by four is cute, but if this child has heard fatty, fatty two by four, uh, that's not a term of endearment, 
that could actually be damaging later on. And so we want to be mindful of things like that when we're trying to create a, a culture of safety and having prudent standards of conduct. Again, keeping confidentiality as a priority. So now we're going to get into some fun stuff. Active supervision. Active supervision is the Office of Head Start's um, way of making sure that there are very specific strategies in place to ensure that educators are keeping children safe. So as I click and move through this slide, you're going to see the six strategies of active supervision. When you're thinking about these strategies, I want you to think about what you already implement in your program. You can type that into chat. Or if you see a strategy on here that you have not seen before, please identify that in chat. That does a couple of things. One, when we're going back and reviewing chat, it tells us some things that we need to raise our awareness on to make sure we talk about so we can then designate your coach to ensure that they're talking about those particular strategies in your program. Two, when we see what everyone is utilizing in chat in regards to active supervision, we now have a better understanding of, wow, these are the really great practices that are keeping children safe. Let's make sure everyone does more of those. So either way, you are informing us on what is working best. I also let me know when a good time is to answer some questions. Absolutely. Um, our next, uh, we're going to do a video next. So let's go through this active supervision, answer questions, and then we'll do video. The videos are short. We only have a couple too. So as you think about setting up your environment, what are some things that you can ensure in your environment that will help you actively supervise young children? These could be things like making sure you actually have child-sized furniture, right? Uh, this could be things like, oh, yeah, no blind spots. Absolutely. Um, these could be making sure that you have no obstructions to young children trying to reach items. So freeing the clutter in your environment. When you... Think about positioning staff. You want to really make sure that your staff has a clear path to seeing children. But also, one of the things that I was in conversation with one of our partnership sites about when it related to position staff that I loved is that positioning of staff and the other strategy listening are actually really super important because you want staff to always be able to be an earshot of a child. And sometimes that can involve not just listening, but also the position of the staff. So if the staff is under a counter and they're cleaning out something and their head is inside the counter, guess what? Listening is hard. So the position of that staff is probably not the best. Instead, that might be something they need to do during nap time. Or that could be something they need to do at the end of the day, or they need to do it at the beginning of the day before their children arrive. Things like that, we just kind of forget about sometimes because we're in the moment and we need to get them done. We want people to be thinking about that all the time because sometimes things can wait, but children can never wait. Scanning and counting is one of my most favorites. I'll be honest with you, I'm a to scan and count, I think involving and engaging children in scan and counting is so much fun. Uh, when a child sees their name um, and their face on something, it just adds a layer of inclusivity and belonging. And so in one of our learning environments moons ago, when I was a director, we had the children's face on a little popsicle with the face laminated, and then we had little numbers behind the face and everyone would get one 
and then they get to turn it around. And it was also another great way of teaching them uh, number recognition, which was really fun. But they would have to find their own photos. And then we would always count out the numbers of the photos that they had on the back. And there was, we always had the children obviously match the number of children we were supposed to have in the classroom, hence the scanning and counting. But it was just a really fun way to engage the children in something that was mandatory to get done anyway. Scan and counting has been around for decades since I can remember. Um, I have walked through a number of our own learning environments with early learning ventures and see so much scanning and counting happening. Um, it's so beautiful. So if that's not a practice that you're familiar with, um, I would highly recommend choosing that to be something you, you may want to adopt. Um, that's a great practice. Um, as well as anticipating children's behavior, of course, really, really getting to know your children and know what activates their behavior, um, as well as what interests them, can be a great way to anticipate their behavior. If you know little Johnny starts to get a little antsy when it comes to, to lunchtime, he gets a little over animated because he's really, really hungry and he gets a little deregulated because he's now focused on his belly and not his other brain then you can engage with little Johnny in a different way that allows him to be a part of maybe even setting up lunch, right? Uh, maybe little Johnny is moving the chairs closer to the table, or maybe little Johnny is um, placing um, his friend's face where they're going to sit, things like that, right? This is an opportunity to really get little Johnny a part of. Leads us into our next one, which is engage and redirect. Again, great strategy for engagement, also meeting his uh, behavioral need as he is getting ready to, to have lunch, but really gives an opportunity for staff to use different techniques to offer support. You know your children best. No one can come into your learning environment and tell you how to engage with your children. However, utilize whatever supports that you have. If you have an opportunity to have someone come in, do observations, make sure that uh, you let them know about the children in your care and what they like. So then that way they can have their attention on those observations and then give you feedback in regards to what they see. This gives you a great opportunity to then advance your practice and how you engage and redirect young children. All right, Riley, you wanna go ahead and check out some things? Yeah, uh, do we wanna start with the chat just to keep on the same page first? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so just some things were uh, using an attendance list where the teacher checks the kids hourly to make sure all kids are accounted for. Um, as directors, this is where we come in and observe the classrooms and ensure these things are taking place. I definitely agree with that. Um, the only thing I can think of as well, though, is when you change rooms or you go to the bathroom or you're moving locations, that is a, it is a time that I've utilized scan and counting. Uh, but if you're in the same room the entire time, um, that makes sense just to, you know, or or to utilize that more mm -hmm. than if you're moving. But we definitely used both as well, too. Um, counting the kids all the time, uh, checklist. Um, and then I think we mentioned the other ones earlier. So, Yeah. Um, so the question we have is from earlier. Uh, I teach the one to two year olds and there are a lot of climbing going on, climbing the little furniture and toy shelves. If there's any tips on climbing, I'm all ears, keeps me busy. Mm. Ooh, so do you have a, a name who shared that? I wonder. Yep, yep this is Jessica. Um, and then it's S-I-T-Z-E-S. Hi, Jessica. I just wanted to, I, I can't see chat right now. I just wanted to, to say hi by name. So Jessica, thank you for sharing. We appreciate that. And by all means, the professionals who are caring directly for busy, 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 busy infants and toddlers, please put your suggestions to Jessica in chat. I will share from my own experience in regards to caring for young children who are busy like that, physically busy. I always like to incorporate that time into our uh, routine and ex expectation. So children had a place to deposit that extra energy because sometimes they just need to get the wiggles out. You know, there could be an opportunity, Jessica, for you to take a glance over your day 
look at your lesson planning and kind of get an idea of, oh, wow, I don't have enough movement in my day. Maybe I need to identify the times that my children are the busiest, the times that they want to climb and intentionally incorporate activities that are pleasing to you because everybody know if mama's happy, everybody's happy. And in the learning environment, the teacher is mama. So make yourself happy by creating the space and engagement of the behavior you want to see from your young ones and twos, right? So it could be things like, you know, maybe at 9, 9.45, you incorporate a line dance, right? And so you're teaching the children in regards to how to line up and uh, do the same movements. It could be head and shoulder, knees and toes, something they're probably familiar with. It could be the baby shark. It could be anything that gives you an opportunity to channel that energy in a way that allows them to move it from head to toe, right? Because we know if we can get children energy out, it makes room for energy to come in. So one of the things that I really enjoy is ah, I'm a huge, huge fan of rhythm and movement. You can do it with materials. You can just do it with their bodies. You can use those safe little thin scars. There's things that you can put on little ones and twos wrist to help them shake. And then you can incorporate and teach them over time how to freeze. Like there's so many different fun things to do. In regards to climbing specifically, that means lower body movement is activated. It needs to go somewhere. Having children gently lay on their backs, put their legs up in the air, and use words that are familiar with them. Let's ride a bike. We're going to ride a bike. We're going to move our legs like this. Watch Miss Jessica. Look at me moving my legs. I just remember we're recording, and now I probably look weird doing this, but... Um, <laughs> You're going to do it also. You want them to mirror everything that you do. When you're doing your rhythm and movement, do the dances with them. Do the shapes. Do the freeze. Show them. Incorporate a mirror even. Bring the mirror around. Look what Johnny is doing, everybody. Johnny is getting his wiggles out. Let's wiggle, 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 right? And so you're having them see what you want to have done. You're doing what you want them to do. And guess what? You're all bonding and connecting and having fun too. It's it's so crazy, I tell you. With infants and toddlers, it's so amazing. If we can really get them to expel as much energy throughout the day, they are so much better off. Like it is tiresome, like you said, it's busy, absolutely, all the things, but that's what they need. That constant regulation time and time and time and time again throughout the day is very important. Because then guess what? They get to eat and rest and refuel just to do it all again. Uh, so yeah, um, I think that would be some really, really awesome, fun things to do. I know a lot of people uh, don't particularly like climbers in their learning environments. That's a preference. Um, I think climbers can be used well um, if they become um, a part of the experience and the routine for young children but sometimes climbers can be a distraction. So it just really depends upon your particular group and how you know them in regards to what's best use. Um, Briley, is there anything great from the chat? Well, it's all great. It's Yeah, there are some great things, honestly. Um, yep, so uh, Jalen said, yes, we have a music area where we get our kiddos to dance and get instruments and play uh, different fun songs and they love it. We do this before lunch. That's a great mm. time. Um, the most important thing is to model, is to be, is to model this, these movements to kids, um, so they follow and engage. Um, we might have to make movement a whole day thing. Thanks for your suggestions. Yep. Um, give options to climb and get that out. Dance parties with direction, songs, Dance listen and move, shake the, your sillies out. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Shake your sillies out. <laughs> oh, That's very cute. I like that a lot. Shake your sillies out. So yes, yes, Jessica, I hope that's helpful. And please, 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 um, if you have screenshot option, you can screenshot the, the suggestions here. Um, but, and those are great. Thank you very much for sharing. I appreciate it. So we are going, to, we're, how are we doing on time? 
I uh, hope everybody's okay. This video is super short, super, super short. Or do you want to take a five minute break real quick right now? You can use your reaction. Um, if you need a five minute break, you want to stretch for a moment, uh, you can put like a thumbs up kind of thing. Um, or if we're okay to continue, we can also just continue, which is great too. Uh, so let us know. Uh, awesome, Jessica. Let's see. Are we good? I think, are we good? All right. I think we're good. We're good? good okay, I don't see any yeah. thumbs, which I don't know if I actually would see them. I don't know, <laughs> to be quite honest. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and hop into uh, a video. Uh, let's see. Yay, it worked. All right. We know that active supervision is the... Sorry, I'm going to turn my volume up real quick most effective safety strategy to prevent child injuries, and that is especially true in outdoor situations. Like classrooms and homes, playgrounds are never static environments. Once the children arrive, they're in motion, and that motion outdoors can be quick. They'll run, climb, jump, throw, play rough, and move towards sprinklers like moths to a flame before you know it. Minor scrapes and bruises are common and almost expected in groups of young children, but serious injury is usually preventable with good supervision practices. Very few things move as fast or unexpectedly as a small child with pent-up energy let loose outdoors. Playgrounds are lots of fun, but also can be dangerous without close attention. The metal, chains, edges, corners, and heights all have inherent dangers that need to be monitored at all times. The outdoors are full of distractions, people, animals, vehicles, and sights and sounds of all kinds. These reasons and more are why your chapter staff should always prepare for distractions and have a plan to be able to monitor all the children as closely as possible when outdoors. Active supervision in an outdoor environment means teachers are actively engaged with children, joining in their play, and are always nearby and available. They should spend much more time interacting with the children than they do with each other, although clear communication between teachers is important. Let's look at some strategies for successful active supervision when you're with children outdoors. First, it's important to set up an environment that aids in active supervision instead of making it harder. Make sure any playground equipment is placed according to safety rules, ensuring fall zones are large enough and have adequate fill materials to meet safety requirements. Regularly inspect the area for any potential hazards. Identify hotspots where children are more likely to need assistance or where visibility can become obscured. Perhaps most importantly, ensure that all children can be seen and heard at all times. This can be accomplished using Zoom assignments for adults. Position staff around the area, facing in toward the playground. Staff should avoid sitting or standing together on the playground and move throughout the area regularly. Scan the area constantly and regularly take account of the kids, doing a name and face recognition check each time. You must have a process in place to account for children who arrive late or leave early so that your group count is continually updated and accurate. Listening is just as important as watching, so avoid any sound distractions and make sure you pay attention to what you hear as well as what you see. If a child is known to climb objects when you're inside, it's more than likely that they'll do the same outside. Use the knowledge you have of each child's individual development and abilities to anticipate what a child may do and prepare for it. Prevention is your best friend when it comes to safety. It's difficult to supervise a whole zone when you're engaged with an individual child or a small group, so plan ahead for distractions. Engagement and redirection are two key pieces of successful prevention of accidents and injuries. Regular engagement with the children allows you to know when to redirect them when necessary to prevent issues from arising. Implementing these strategies for active supervision when outdoors can dramatically lower the chances of injuries and incidents with children. Um, oh, I think I went too far. Hold on. Just kidding. So as you heard through the video, thank you for engaging in that. Um, 
think about your kiddos. What came up for me when I watched this video this particular time was, was Jessica's question, actually, uh, about the, the indoor movement and activities. I'm curious, Jessica, and you can respond in chat if you'd like, or, or just listen. You don't have to respond if you don't want to, but I am curious. Your indoor climbers, based off the video, do you also recognize them as outdoor climbers um, outside? Because uh, I, I do think that that is a huge, huge opportunity for us to raise our awareness around because most behavior that happens indoors happens outdoors. So if you know you have a climber, they're probably going to climb. If you know you have a thrower, they're probably going to throw things. If you have a jumper, they're probably going to jump off things, right? So uh, that's what came up for me as we were watching that just now. And I was thinking about, huh, I wonder if Jessica's kiddo also climbs and wiggles about and has a lot of movement outdoors too. So that was just on my on my mind when I was watching that video just now. And uh, just just curious about that. And, and, and anyone else too, if you have uh, kiddos that you care for and you notice their behavior indoors, anticipate that behavior outdoors too. I think that's a good way to to raise our awareness around caring for young children. So Jessica said they act the same way outside. So when you're outside, I make sure that fo to focus on these climbers and guide them to be more active and supervise them. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for saying, sharing that, Jessica, so much. Um, sorry, I'm playing with my thing. So I was trying to see if I can minimize it somehow. But every time I click on it, the slides just move. <laughs> so thank you for sharing, y'all. I appreciate it so very much. And we're going to now talk about uh, additional safety practices. And we are over the halfway point, actually, which is fantastic. Um, so we're going to go ahead and go over a few more things here. When we think about safety of young children in our care, we, of course, must always think about eyes on children. Um, that is so very important. It is something that cannot go um, unseen. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, I get a little giddy in the morning. Um, but it is really, really important to never leave a child alone and to have a good system to where you have your co-teacher and you are constantly making sure that you all have eyes on children. Again, it goes back to our six strategies in regards to positioning yourselves uh, as well as anticipating behavior, of course, and engaging and redirecting uh, all the things. It's all tied together, but just wanted to, to share with you all some additional safety practices. Now is a fantastic time for you to put in chat. If you have any additional practices in excess of what was shared in the video, what you see on this slide here around never leaving a child alone, maintaining ratios and group sizes, which is super important and we know lead to major safety of young children, maintaining attendance logs as they talked about, following your program release procedures. So that's that um, authorized release, routinely uh, conduct face to name counts, as well as regularly trained contractors, consultants, volunteers, and your staff, of course, on active supervision practices and safety practices. If you have anything in, in excess of that that you wanna share with us as a learning group today, uh, please feel free to, to share that in chat. We would definitely like to, to hear that. All right, so we're gonna move in and talk about some equipment. I think that's next, yep. All right, so as we think about, oh, wait a second. Okay, never mind. As we think about uh, equipment and materials, there are certain behaviors in which we can do as educators to ensure that children are safe around the equipment and materials that we utilize. So we want you all to type in the chat again, of course, if you would like, or just think about um, items that should be considered when you are thinking about equipment and materials that are used with young children to help keep them safe. 
We always want to make sure that the materials and the items that we use to care for children are clean, that they are disinfected, that they're age appropriate, uh, that they are actually designed to aid and support supervision. So child height. Um, we want to make sure that things allow for separation of different age groups as well as uh, kept safe through preventative measures. And so as you think about those components, what items could you consider in regards to that? So actual physical items like chairs and tables and uh, indoor, outdoor play structures and materials and fall zones and things like that. Um, type into chat if anything else comes to mind. anything coming through chat we're still discussing the last one um at oh. this point mm -hmm. yep so nothing new to this slide yet that makes sense I am going to see if I can make this work without messing it up too badly. I'm going to pop over to, um, nope, not to that. I'm going to pop over to Zoom because I, I do have a couple cool questions. I'm going to see if I can activate. I might be able to. Sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. Uh, let's see. Let's see if it'll let me. Oh, yeah, I think it is. I'm going to see if I can do this in here. No, I didn't do it right. I have no idea. We're moving on. All right. I was going to try to see if I can launch a quick poll, but I, I don't know how to do it, which is okay. <laughs> I'll practice that next time. All right. We're going to move on and switch gears here into positive behavioral guidance and supporting positive behavior interactions and a video. I love videos, if it's not obvious. Um, I think videos is a great way to, of course, break up the monotony of a tone of voice, uh, as well as just stimulate our pupils to see things in a way that once we see the video, then we can connect the, the words, of course. So we are going to watch this video, and then I will just summarize a couple key points at the end. And again, it's very quick. It's fun to work with kids, except when it's not. While occasional disruptive behavior can happen, it should be rare. One response to misbehavior is the classic timeout. Unfortunately, as tempting as putting a child in timeout may be, it's been shown to have lasting negative effects on future behavior. In other words, timeouts and isolation don't work in the long run. So instead, let's look at two much better options, prevention and proper response. Prevention starts by forming positive relationships with the children in your care. Positive relationships help prevent challenging behaviors from starting. Children pattern their own actions after observing the adults in their lives. You can also help children learn self-regulation, independence, and cooperation by how you approach requests. Always consider the child's interests and include choices whenever possible. This builds respect, invites cooperation, and satisfies a child's need for power and control. For example, when it's time to clean up, give children ownership by asking whether they'd like to pick up the toys first or put books away first. Even with best prevention practices, child will occasionally lose control and yell, throw a toy, or both. 
If this happens, your first priority should be to make sure everyone is safe. Then stay calm and stay close. Consider how you'd want to be talked to if you had done something wrong. Don't say, I'm disappointed in you. Empathize with the feeling. When the child is ready, quietly say, let's go back and play now. When you focus on preventing this behavior and use calming strategies to diffuse disruptive behavior, you'll have a more productive, creative, and harmonious class and happier, healthier kids, not to mention a happier, calmer you. Child Care Resources has more helpful suggestions, techniques, and courses to help you learn and practice these and other positive guidance techniques. Visit childcareresources.org or call us to learn more. It's fun. Awesome. Thank you all so much for letting us play that video. Uh, just a couple points I want to uh, highlight from the video is that disruptive behaviors should be rare, of course. We're talking disruptive behavior, right? Um, and so when you have a system in place that you practice consistently, you really have a good idea about behaviors, when you are developing your system is where you actually want all of those awesome behaviors to come out because those behaviors are communicating to you in regards to what you're practicing, if it's something you should cont continue to practice or if it's something that you want to revise. So this is all fantastic communication from young children through their behavior, right? One of the things we want to pull out of this video is again about that timeout. That, that, that timeout is, is, is not as good as we used to think from years ago, right? We really wanna work on engaging, teaching and demonstrating with our young children of the positive behavior guidance that we really wanna see. So if we want them to be uh, cool, calm and kind and keep everything safe, then we have to show them how to be cool, calm and kind and keep things safe. So when we're thinking about prevention, the number one prevention, this is a biased opinion, of course, the number one prevention uh, when it comes to behavior is relationships. Having those strong, solid relationships to the young children in your care is pivotal to the success of your programs. It really is. Uh, those relationships mean everything. They can help redirect natural, naturally the behavior that children show. They can help children naturally calm down. They're going to seek you out when they need help uh, co-regulating. And so having those strong, strong, strong relationships can be a preventative measure when caring for young children. Hi, we uh, have a question if yes. we want to. Yep. Um, so Logan, Logan, thanks for asking this question. If you can respond to my message in chat too, while I'm sharing this, that'd be great. Um, so he said, would you say the same strategy would work for after school children? And I wanted to say this out loud, just so Logan, you hear that and you can give me a little bit more context of what strategy you are referring to. Mm. Unless if it's more obvious to you, Ty. Um, I'm wondering if, if Logan is talking about positive guidance in regards to behavior. So yeah, I'm not sure. Logan, you want to share? Um, you said from the video. Okay. From from the video regarding which part? Specifically, like. Mm-hmm. Did he type something? Mm -mm. No, not yet. I will tell you, Logan, just in general speaking, when you're talking about school age children, infant, toddlers, preschool, pre K, K, beyond school age, relationships, relationships, relationships is everything. If children know that you have their best interests at heart and they know you want to meet their needs, and they know that you are a trusted person for them, that in itself can be preventative when it comes to guiding behavior. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're talking about, but I will say the 
more engaged and connected that the caregiver is at any age with a child, the more trust and security that child is going to have. And so they're going to act a certain way. That relationship is a key ingredient in regards to guiding behavior, whether you're talking about responding or prevention. Did Logan Um, talk anything else? yeah, he said cleaning up or, or any other parts mentioned. One thing I would add, Ty, is just being consistent as well, too. Um, uh, uh, Logan, you know, I, I visit occasionally and my background is in like early elementary education. And a lot of these things are very similar. Um, they're just a little bit different in the sense of age appropriateness. Um, but my biggest would be being consistent. That would probably be my golden ticket. I love that, Bri, so much. That's so awesome, definitely. Um, Logan said in regards to cleaning up. Yep, cleaning up or any other parts mentioned. Does does Logan, I wonder, Logan, do you assign children responsibilities when they're in your care to help with that cleaning up piece? Did he type something? No, not yet. Oh, yep. Okay. Yes, I also play music while they do. Oh, that's awesome. You know, while they're cleaning up and you're playing music, uh, do you ever pause the music and say, everyone freeze? I don't know why I just froze. But anyways, you you, you feel what I'm saying? <laughs> he, 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 said, he said no. I got lost in a moment with you, Logan. Sorry. Uh, I don't know. Like, I thought you were going to tell me to unfreeze. I don't know what just happened. Um, but uh, what I'm saying is, is that children love games, right? They don't really love chores. So I would just scaffold that routine that you do a little bit and maybe throw a freeze game in there. All school agers know how to play freeze, right? And you can let them know that sometime when we're cleaning up, guys, I'm just going to throw the freeze game in there. We're going to see who's paying attention. You know, you can present it how you choose. You know your children better than anyone. Um, but throwing a little, little spin in regards to how you're doing things can be really, really fun, especially for school agers. You know, one of the things I'm having a memory now pop up um, in regards to when I used to do some volunteer work at the Y is I would also do a scavenger hunt in regards to cleaning up too. Like mm -hmm. I would have our older kiddos look for very specific things in regards to cleaning up. And I would also challenge them to like, if you, if you clean this area up before you clean this area up, we're going to do X or we're going to have extra this, or we're going to have extra time for that. Because making space when you're cleaning up is also another opportunity to engage in more activity with the children, right? So like, just play around with it. Like I said, you know your children best and see what they like, especially if they like playing like basketball or, you know, table tennis, whatever you have accessible to you. If you know that they really enjoy something, that could be so much fun for them to make space for something else, right? Um, so I would just really, really consider your, your audience, consider the kiddos that you care for and how you can make it fun for them. Because when you make it fun for them, you also make it fun for yourself. So it's a win-win. Great connection. Thank you, Logan. And so in thinking about that, we're thinking about how in the video they talked about response uh, and really empathizing with the feelings of the young children instead of saying, well, that makes Miss Briley sad. Well, that's what it's, I see where you're going with that. Or you can say, wow, I see what you're doing is making so-and-so sad. I know what I feel like when I'm sad and I have this behavior. I wonder what we can do differently to have other behavior that can make us feel something else. So really, really trying to get on that child's level to their understanding of what's happening and what's going on and empathize with them instead of having this communication about what their behavior is creating, you really, really want to talk about, oh, I see. That would make me sad too. I'm so sorry you're sad. 
sometimes when I'm sad, I cry. Sometimes I get quiet. Sometimes I sit by myself for a moment. And describing for the child what sad is for you or what happy is for that matter or any other feeling that they may be having in that moment. We really want to always just consider how we're talking with children versus at children. Um, that is also very responsive. So we want to think about it in the terms of when the words that are coming out of my mouth, do they sound like I'm pointing my finger or does it sound like I'm beside the child and I'm with them and I'm down talking with them? Because sometimes we have a tendencies to point our language at children instead of engaging our language with children. We want them to be in the activity with us and in the experience with us more than anything, instead of just telling, 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 telling. So those are just some things to think about in regards to positive guidance. Obviously, from our experts from the chat, we want to um, adhere to the different examples and the sharings that folks shared out too. So please make sure you're, you're looking and viewing and, and seeing that as well. Anything new pop up in chat, Robbie? Um, just, uh, they also kind of echoed your mystery, your mystery game as well too. And just some, um, affirmations of that. They love those ideas. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing team. Uh, so now we're going to move into talking about positive relationships which we've been kind of talking about all along, but we came up with some key words that we want to hopefully activate this concept around positive relationships. So I'm going to try my best not to mess this up and do this one at a time for sake of translation, which I have messed up multiple times before. Uh, so I'm going to do better. <laughs> Cultivate. So how are you ensuring the development of positive relationships between yourselves, your children, your families, but also your teammates or your teaching teams. So we want you all to be thinking about how do you cultivate these relationships, okay? You can put in chat. You can also privately disclose any questions that you have around relationships and identify if you want us to say them aloud. But Think about this. How do you cultivate these relationships with children and families and your teammates? Um, this is very important to think about. The relationships between children, family, and the provider are pivotal to the success of that, that family being a part of your learning community. So showing up when you say you're going to show up, being present when you do show up, being engaged when you show up, and making sure that you are getting to know what the interests of that child and that family and your teammate um, are. Because we really want to make sure that when we're cultivating these relationships and we're growing this positivity, that we're also given the opportunity to get to know one another. Maintain. Maintaining these strong relationships with children and families, we have certain strategies in Early Head Start that gives us the opportunity to maintain these relationships. So we utilize things like the home visits, uh, the parent-teacher conferences to build those strong, healthy relationships. Also, please do not discount hallway talks. I love when I'm stopped in a hallway in a family or a teacher ask a question or something, that is a point of entry. That is a connection point. So do not discount that. That is a great way to maintain relationships when you're communicating with people. Those little hallway chats, what do people call them? Uh, coffee room or break room chats? Or I've heard people say different things. If you know off the top of your head, put it in chat and remind us and Briley or read it to us. But there's something that people always call them, not flybys. I don't know. They call them something. And I think this one sounds familiar. Somebody said water cooler. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Who yeah. And I've heard of that one. Uh, that was, uh, is it Jay? I can't see the whole name. John. J-O-N-N. -N. John oh. Santos. Oh, 
Nice work. Thank you, my friend. Water cooler chats, water cooler talks, the best. And let me just tell you, in our organization at EOB. Oh, yes, we. <laughs> I know, right, bro? Yeah, I'm like, that's why I know what it's called is because we have a chat named Water Cooler. I'd probably never heard of that before until then. Oh, my goodness. That's so funny. And that's exactly where my mind went to was the water cooler at our job. And I was like, what is it called? So thank you, John, for giving us that gift. I appreciate you so much. I could not think of it. <laughs> All right. Encourage. We want to always encourage family engagement. Again, with Early Head Start uh, and all of our partnership sites, we do encourage you to have those family engagement events um, and uh, have families give you options and choices and your parent committee comes with choices and opportunities to engage families. Very important. Implementation, um, having schedules, routines, expectations, experiences, that children can count on that increases their awareness around what to expect from day to day. Super, super important. It allows for that um, cortisol level to be lessened. So then that way their awareness and engagement is higher. So they're not curious or wondering, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen today? They know when they arrive to school, someone's gonna greet them, someone's gonna uh, know their name and someone's gonna welcome them in, right? They already know that. Providing access to an early childhood mental health consultant or any other specialist um, that may be needed. We have been very privileged and honored to welcome in a highly, highly trained and experienced early interventionist. Um, her name is Laura, Laura Vega Flores. If you have not met LVF, shame on you. I'm just kidding. That's a joke. Um, I am kidding, not shame on you. But I really do hope you get an opportunity to meet uh, Laura. She is phenomenal. Her depth of awareness around behaviors, expectations of young children, typical child development, atypical child development is really, really super helpful. Um, she is very, very passionate about um, where she is able to add value into our partnership sites around teachers and teaching teams engaging with young children. If you have not reached out to her, please, please do. She will actually travel and come to you on site too. She's super good at traveling. Uh, she will also meet with you virtually, which is super awesome. And um, she's just a great resource and she can host office hours with you, um, et cetera. So please do not hesitate to connect with our Laura, said our Laura, <laughs> a little possessive, but uh, she's fantastic. You'll love her. And let's see what else we got here. Develop. So developing these positive behavior support plans. Again, uh, uh, Laura Vega Flores as our early intervention coordinator, she can also help you with that. She can become a part of your um, case management team. She can help and be an intermediary in communication. Like she's just well-versed at the early intervention realm um, in all aspects. This is my most favorite one is believe. We charge each and every one of us to truly, truly believe that all children behavior is communication. I can't express or stress that enough. All children's behavior is communication. And the cool thing about that, sometimes children communicate very well, which means they behave very well, right? But other times, children, they communicate in different ways. And we like to call that misbehavior or challenging behavior. I am actually going to challenge each of us as educators to get rid of that mindset and to get rid of that thinking and instead embrace the fact that we believe this child is communicating something to us, something with us. We have to figure out what's going to be the next best strategy to help this child engage in a way that allows their behavior for communication to be heard and then, of course, change. Because if a child is communicating with hitting, biting, kicking, scratching, punching, then they're missing something. 
behavior tells us so much about the emotional need of young children as well as adults. We behave the way we do because our feelings are hurt. We're angry. We're hungry. Um, we don't feel seen, heard, or respected. There's something happening within us that makes us behave this way. Children do not have the words to articulate or to tell us, I'm behaving this way because. Instead, they just behave, which is their way of telling us. And so now our response to that communication then, of course, drives what happens next. And so we really want to believe that all children's behavior is a form of communication. Again, I can't stress that aspect enough. I feel like that is something that's very, very important to give some emphasis around. Please add any other additional thoughts and comments as you think about children's behavior being communication. Um, as we shared before, that, that child-teacher interaction is everything. Greeting children with hellos and goodbyes and utilizing their names, man, does that give you a sense of belonging. Um, that is such a big deal, and it's something easy that we all can do. Sure, we love calling children our little apple, apple dumpling, sugar plum, kiki, smee smees. But man, when I call little Johnny, and I say, hey, Johnny, it's so good to see you today. How was your sister Bree last night? Yeah, you guys slept well. I'm so glad to hear that. Changes the game for little Johnny. Johnny's like, wait a second. Miss Briley knows Bree. That's my sister. Bree's at home. Oh, okay. Guess she's good. Makes them think about the relationships with you. They may not be able to voice that, but they're thinking about it and they're connecting to it. Uh, again, I can't stress enough. Teacher to child ratios are very important. Uh, in early Head Start, we do in centers, uh, we have a four to one ratio. That's uh, really, really important to adhere to, to be in compliance with early Head Start ratios. Group sizes should not exceed eight. So two teachers, eight children. In the event there is a ninth child, you do have to have a third teacher. So you can go up to a group size of nine in centers, but you do have to have a third teacher. In family child care homes, it's a one to six ratio. When you get to 12, you do have to have two educators as well, okay? And we support all of that, of course, as you all know. Create opportunities for children to make choices. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. I love giving children choices, but too much choice is just too much choice. Two choices. But the key to those two choices is only give children the two choices that you want them to make, because now you're making yourself happy. So if you know something's about to happen next and it's right before the transition, you don't want to give little Sarah and Susie the choice of something that is going out of the ways of their routines and expectations. You want to give little Sarah, Sarah and Susie the choices that's leading into that next event. That is such a cool way to embed your own support of yourself into your daily practices. So now your two choices are not only meeting the need of giving that child some autonomy, they're meeting your need in regards to the routines and expectation and experiences you have set for the day. It's a win-win situation, okay? Something to think about, you guys. Think about the choices that you're giving young children. Make sure they're aligned with the choices that you foresee happening in your future or what's happening next and make those a reality. Be consistent and responsive to children's needs. Talk with children during care routines. Diaper changes are an amazing time to engage with young children. Talking with the child, no matter how old they are, no matter what their developmental level is, that is a one-on-one -on -one private special time, even though it's in the middle of the classroom, we all know that, <laughs> but it is a one-on-one -on -one special time that the educator gets to have with that one child. Make the most of it. Narrate and think uh, aloud about your own actions and the next step with children. Um, many people I'm sure are familiar with that. That is a huge part of the class observation tool, really making sure that children know what you're doing, what you're about to do, as well as helping them realize what their own peers are doing as well. Asking those open-ended questions, 
So that's avoiding simple yes and no's. Instead, you're challenging children's thinking uh, to actually answer questions that takes more than one response. So they can give a two word or a three word that's technically a complete sentence for a young infant toddler that actually answers your question. And of course, one of my favorites, making the connection between home and school. Super, super wonderful thing to do. Miss Briley did that when she said hello to little Johnny and identified Bree and asked if they slept well last night. That's connecting home and school. It happens that fast. So something to consider. Anything great from chat, Brad? Um, one question we have is what types of social emotional check-in tools do you use at the beginning of the day? I remember seeing an emotions chart from Nebula at RMECC and would love to implement something like that or would something where a child can choose if they want to hug, fist bump, wave, etc. One thing I'd ask before you respond, Ty, is just, I'm uh, just curious which age group you typically, mm. um, you typically work with because I think that that definitely affects um, your response for age appropriateness. You said four to five, so preschool, four to five. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Those The older kiddos, it is super, super, super easier, I guess I could say, to use tools like that. Absolutely. With infants and toddlers, I would keep it really, really simple. Really, really simple. Because remember, we want to do things that's to their understanding, not just to our understanding, right? Because the more things we do to their understanding and age appropriately for them, the more engaged and a part of they can be. So if I'm an infant or a toddler and Briley's my teacher and I'm coming into the room for the first time of the day, first of all, I'm making eye contact, right? And that tells me that my teacher sees me right then and there. So we're already connected. Now my teacher is reading my mood. Am I ready to be handed off to my mom? Did my teacher ask, oh, are you ready to come with Miss Ty? I bet you had a good night with your mom. Yes. Okay. I put my hands out. That's engagement. That's a beautiful way to say hello to infants, right? Absolutely. Using their name, eye contact, physically asking them, are they ready? If they are not physically ready, creating a routine for each child that needs to be dropped off in a certain way is also a great way to do helloing, right? What you, what you want to avoid is doing things that are above the child's understanding. What you do want to do is you want to engage in things that not only meet your need to show that you're being proactive and responsive, but you want to do things that meet that child's need that shows that you see them and you understand them. If you know that coming to learning environment, you're about to get a child into your classroom who loves a particular item, doing a helloing with that particular item is fantastic. Great way to engage. If you know little, little, little Tammy loves uh, musical instruments, have the musical instruments close to the door when little Tammy's slot is, is time to come in. And that way little Tammy can come in with the maraca or little Tammy can come in with the tamarind or little Tammy can come in with the little egg shakers, whatever the case may be. You want to do things that's very, very age appropriate to the understanding of the child or children that you're caring for. That's, that's the, the best thing. It's not prescribed per se, it's just recommended to do it with consistency and, and be repetitive about it, right? If the one thing doesn't seem to work that one day, try it for the next seven days. Try it for the next 10 days. Try it for the next 15 days. If it doesn't work after that, then try something different. When we start throwing a plethora or many things at children, that just dysregulate them even more. Consistent, consistent, consistent. Repetition, 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 because then they're going to know ooh, in my mind, I'm thinking I get to go to class and I get to see my first toy that I love of the day when I come in. What a great way to hello and welcome me to my learning community. So keeping it age appropriate, keeping it simple and really making sure you know the children who you're engaging with is the best way. I love all of those other practices. I love the YouTube videos. I love the TikToks. I love all that. But for infants and toddlers, which is who we typically care for um, under early head start, that may not be the most appropriate things. Now for older toddlers, 
like when they're getting ready to age out, those three-year-olds, heck yeah. If, if, if little Johnny likes a high five or Nux, absolutely get into that routine. Yes. Or if little Billy is not a touchy, touchy guy, but he likes to wiggle and jiggle and you know that, absolutely use your wiggle and jiggle. Um, however, be mindful again of the age of which you're engaging with. Thank you for sharing that. That's fantastic. All right. As we were just talking about that social emotional health piece. I think that we pretty much covered all that. Creating a warm environment, provide space for open communication about children's feelings, encourage problem solving at the child's level of understanding. Super important. Use positive tone of voice. Provide comfort and reassurance. Like that empathy piece too. Celebrate children's attempts and accomplishments. Read children's signals when distress and anticipate own positive behavior response. That's a self-check right there, y'all. Make sure you check yourself. If you know a certain behavior presses your hot button, please know that. Know what behaviors press your hot button. There, that does not make you a bad teacher. That makes you a responsive teacher. I will tell you right here and there, when I was a teacher in the learning environment, a child spit on me, they could kick, scratch, pinch, bite, I don't care. But if they spit on me, that was my hot button. Matter of fact, type your hot buttons in chat. Let the world be known, okay? Type your hot button in chat. I'd be very curious to know what some folks' hot buttons are. I can't see chat, so Riley will share it out loud with us. <laughs> Type in some hot buttons. I, I will be typing in spitting. Hmm. That just gets me. Riley, what gets you? Or what I'm, got you? I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm reflecting on that right now. Um, I think in general, so I taught mostly kindergarten. Um, it's just in general, defiance to be defiant, especially like six months into the school year and not like in the beginning. Um, and knowing I've built a relationship and and we have this, you know, connection and, and um, in a sense to them, you know, we're a version of friends. Um, and so when they would do something to be defiant, I'd be like, I would refer to the friend piece and say, you know, is this something that you would do? You know, like, this is how this is making me feel right now. And yeah. Yep. <laughs> so we've got, oh, we got a lot. I love this. Um, fighting, fighting your authority and screaming at you, tattling. Mm -hmm. Uh, when his, a beard gets pulled. Oh. Telling me, Yeah. Telling me no, screaming in peers' faces, screaming in face, um, smacking me in my face. Yep. Yeah, those are rough. Yeah. Those are rough. I can't stand when people pull my beard either. I'm just kidding. That beard pulling is real. I, I remember when my, uh, my youngest brother, when he was a teacher, um, that was one of the things that got his goat too. Ooh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Monica said, uh, yes, when, when spitting happens too, she doesn't like that. Um, smacking me in my face. Uh, my staff said crazy sounds, high-pitched screams, tattling, looking at you before doing something they're not supposed to do, purposely ignoring you. That's good. Yeah. Oh, thank you for reminding me of that one. When some little child know they are about to do something they're not supposed to do and they look at you to make sure you're paying attention. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm reminded, Briley, that's a great opportunity to communicate about a child's feeling too. Because mm -hmm. if you can describe, name, and acknowledge what that child is experiencing in that moment, that might be a great point of entry to curb behavior. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One, another one was asking 
the same thing 10 times, I'd stop asking. <laughs> stop asking. I would have to tag team that one. Oh man, that that is so true though. That's a good point. Oh, that's such a good point. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for sharing. And uh, that is the entire dissemination of all the information that we had to share. Very specific information around incident reporting, child health and safety, and positive behavior guidance. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to reflect on a couple things. And we're going to see in this brief moment what we may have retained um, and just know that there are no right or wrong answers. There are answers that might be incorrect or may need some further discussion. But if, if that is something that you think, um, we can talk further about. So we are looking obviously for very specific responses, but just know that, just respond, take a guess, take a gander, and uh, we can always discuss further, whether it's here, um, whether it's while you're filling out your evaluation, uh, if you want to come off mute, we can allow you to come off mute and you can ask questions about things for clarity. But we really want to make sure that everyone has a grasp of this information. So we're going to do a, just a quick moment. This usually takes about three, four minutes. Show what you know. I will put the options up there after I read the question. Within what time frame must a child safety incident be reported to ELB? Here are your options. As soon as possible within 24 hours of the incident recur occurring, within seven calendar days, within five business days. So take a guess, Gander, or, or know about which of these, and then I'll pop the answer on the screen in just a moment. Any, any uh, correct answers in chat? <laughs> <laughs> All of the correct answers in chat. Yes. I'm yes. achieved. <laughs> yes. Great work, team. All right. And here's your correct answer. So if if you put in 24 hours, uh, you are absolutely correct. Please and thank you. We would like to keep this grant for as long as we can. <laughs> we love this work. All right. Who? do the standards of conduct apply to? This is a very, very hard question. So pay attention. Who do the standards of conduct apply to? Anyone who comes into contact with children at my program, only hired staff, hired staff and volunteers, hired staff, consultants and volunteers. Anyone who comes into contact with children at my program, hired staff, consultants and volunteers, Anything coming in the chat? Uh, we've just got two responses. Three, four. Yep. Yep. We're catching on. This is this this was a little this was a little uh what do you want to call it? Um not a it wasn't a trick question, but it's a good question. Mm -hmm. Ready? Bam. Yep. Who said anyone? Did anyone say anyone? <gasps> everyone said anyone. everyone said anyone awesome great work team great work team all right thank you so much for sharing everybody now you know every time that someone underlines the word not that the question is interesting which of the following is not considered an appropriate safety practice is not considered an appropriate safety practice. Here are your choices. Implementing active supervision strategies at all times. Sorry, I, I always giggle a little bit at the first, first one because I'm like, <laughs> maintaining proper ratio and group sizes at all times. Playing videos to keep children occupied. Providing regular training for staff, contractors, consultants, and volunteers. Again, we're answering which of the following is not the father. No, I'm just kidding. It is not <laughs> considered appropriate safety practices. 
Ty, I feel like we're uh, in a high school classroom and we're playing a Kahoot and it's one of the answers that you're like, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's that one. But, but when I use that in second grade, I would just pick random Kahoots that like seem to align. I wouldn't make them myself. And then there'd be questions that would come up and you're like, you just gave them a throwaway. What? <laughs> I love Kahoot, actually. Yeah. You can never get it to work right. Oh, I love Kahoot. I used it so often. I love it when other people get it to work and I get to participate. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's, that'd be a good follow-up fun training to do is use Kahoot. Um, oh, I should probably reveal the answers. <laughs> if you send yes. videos or videos or play videos, You are correct. So hopefully the majority of us answered in that way. All right. Oopsies, I'm cheating. There we go. Which of the following are ways to foster positive relationships? Which of the ways to foster positive relationships? Maintain strong relationships with families. Implement schedules, routines, and experiences to increase awareness. Develop positive behavior support plans. Deny children's behavior as communication. Dun, dun, dun. Awesome, 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 awesome. Who's guessing what? This is a hard question. It's not a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who's guessing what? Which of the following are ways to foster positive relationships? Positive relationships. Mm -hmm. I have to say it before you say it, but I'll give it up to Don because Don was the first one to say what, Don what I believe is the correct answer. All but deny. Woohoo! I don't know. Let's see if that's right. <gasps> Yay! Yay! Very nicely done. So absolutely, y'all. We want to maintain these strong relationships with families. We must implement schedules, routines, and expectation and experiences. This really does help the child know what's about to happen, uh, as well as develop uh, positive behavior support plans. And again, I can't stress enough, utilizing our early intervention coordinator, um, Laura Vega Flores. She's phenomenal at that, and she will absolutely help and support you. Please, please believe. Please believe that all children's behavior is communication. Cannot stress that enough. Alrighty, this is our last question regarding positive behavior guidance. Which of the following are ways to support children's social emotional health? Encourage problem solving at your level of understanding create a warm and nurturing environment, celebrate children's attempts and accomplishments, use a tone of voice that intimidates or scares the child. Which of the following are ways, are ways to support children's social, emotional health? Create a warm environment, encourage problem solving at your level, celebrate children's attempts, use a tone that intimidates. Any guesses already in chat yet? Yep. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yep, uh, it's looking like mostly all but tone. It's a trick question, keep that in mind. Yep, Um. somebody said it should be at their level Woo -woo! who said that what are their names call them out <laughs> uh harley thank you harley Very and i i might have missed another one <laughs> I, but but that's who i see for sure awesome so yeah that, this was this was a little tricky and on purpose because we really do want to remind us to make sure that if we are encouraging problem solving it must be at the level of the child not at our level, right? Like we have to be at the level of the child's understanding. So for this answer, it is create a warm and nurturing environment and celebrate children's attempts and accomplishments. Outstanding, mm -hmm. people.
that's where it's at. So we are done with our official um, recording and dissemination of information. I am going to try to find wherever the recording button is, somewhere around here, and I will stop recording. Because right now what we're going to do is we are going to give opportunity for y'all to fill out the survey. We're going to put that Google Doc back in chat, please, Briley. Make sure everyone signed in. If you haven't made a comment or anything, just put a dot uh, in, the, in the chat. That would be fantastic. Uh, we really want to make sure that we capture everyone who's been present today. So that way you um, have been documented for attendance. Okay. So we yep. are going to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And John said, uh, can you see who's filled it out? It just, it, I, this is what I've been saying is that if you feel like you didn't fill it out, fill it out. Because I know that in my experience with Google Forms, you can delete duplicates. Um, but I would say we're probably not going to look at the list right now and make sure everybody has done it. So just if you have or you feel like you haven't, just do it again. Please and thank you. Yes. So I will stop recording. Again, we appreciate everyone for being present. I will ask that early Head Start Child Care Partnerships, uh, actual teachers, owners, directors, family child care business owners, stay on. We're going to, we have a two minute dissemination of some things that are coming up. Uh, and I'm going to pop in the chat, the survey. The survey is what uh, activates us to send you a certificate. So in addition to cross-referencing the Google Doc to make sure everyone was signed in. So I'm going to pop that in the chat real fast.